Hi, this is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, and I am a communication coach and consultant. Hi, I'm Onifa Harris, and I'm a voice empowerment coach. And you're here for the sixth episode of Ephemeral. And the title for this episode is Your Presence is Required to Be in the Now. To kick us off, Manifa is going to talk about how she came to this topic. And we're going to continue to just talk about the importance of both presence and the now in our practices as coaches and how it affects our clients. Yes. Um, so this is one of those topics that just came to me. Um, I was not thinking about it, <laughs> um, but I was having a conversation with a colleague and she was talking about this concept of a presence and now that she's heard a lot in like kind of the new age, I guess if you want to call it that spiritual community. And um, I was like, well, what's the difference? I'd never thought about it, right? And she was like, okay, well, presence is something that you need the context of time for. So um, presence is like you're present or you're, you know, absent, right? <laughs> so like depending on where you are as a time frame or in relationship to others is just where the time construct begins spiritually, right? And then there was now, which was just the focus of this instant, right? So it did not necessarily require a, a framework or a relationship to something else to be. Um, so maybe we could also talk about it as a difference between being and becoming, which is what Shannon was yeah. talking about when we had our conversation. So yeah, so that's what made me think of it. And, um, and of course my mind just took off from there because mm -hmm. in order for me to understand something, I have to feel it, right? <laughs> and so I was like, well, when have I ever felt this? You know, what's the difference for me? Um, did you want to tell them the definition that we that I put in the chat? Or sure, you wanna... I can yeah. I can do it if you like. So we had looked up presence just for this kind of like a common ground that you might be able to associate with and connect with, and we got this from Oxford. And presence is defined as the state or fact of existing, occurring, or being present in a place or thing. Right. And it kind of makes you continue that conversation of, well, what does it mean, right? Because you can say it in a spiritual context where you're saying, well, time, and then are, are you present and aware of a situation? And then we tend to speak of that spiritually as like, is your energy active in this moment, right? Um, as opposed to being away and in, in thinking maybe about something else. And, um, and then if you wanna say like what you said, like about having the thoughts or memories. Yes. So I think, you know, this, this goes back to Manifa and my work because one of the things that we've really focused in our own lives and our own practice, I actually started with Manifa and she started with me as a, someone who teaches yoga and meditation and her teaching voice is how can we be in a place where we can be present in our, in our, in our tools and our practice, how can we build that? So that's one thing that I think Manifa and I spoke about too, is if presence is over a duration of time, how do you get to a place where you're highly distracted which is to me, the sort of like Western way is being distracted by all these things. I think since COVID happened, that's changed, right? In a sense, we're less distracted because we're out less, but in a sense, we're more distracted because now we're stuck at home and there's all the amazing distractions at home, like Netflix and <laughs> HBO now. And so there are all these things, but I think there's something interesting to be said about that is that presence that there's a demand, I think, with both of these terms. And that's something that Manifa and I wanted to talk about and talk about how our process of working on our own and then working with clients can sort of debunk those demands. Because I think if you don't have the practice or you don't have someone to work with you, you might think I'm just expected to be present right now and not be distracted or not think of the past or have memories creep in that will take me from what's happening 
right now in front of me. And just, I think like you were saying, you have to experience it in order to know it. And I think that there's a difference between presence, something that's built over time and something that, that has to do with awareness, I think too, like how to read information not in just an analytical way, but with your senses so you can respond. And that's something that takes time and practice. We're not trained to do that in school, in conventional education, you know, traditional education. Maybe if you're in Waldorf, but very few people come from that background. Yeah, I don't even know what Waldorf is. So. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that was something else that came up as, as we were dissecting what it means for us. We were like, well, honestly, it, it doesn't have a meaning unless you've had the experience. Mm -hmm. It's just a word. Um, but and once you've had the experience, even you kind of have to be aware of the difference, right? Yes. So it's, it requires a certain level of awareness. And that's essentially where the where the title came from, because they were like, well, you know, you can't even get to the now if you're not aware of when you're not or when you are yes. present, you know, so. And sometimes and I think for me, uh, because I work in communication and tell me how maybe tell me how this crosses over to your work, Manifa. But I think about how part of being present is knowing how to respond to your environment. So there's a self-awareness and then there's awareness of environment. And that goes beyond, again, the analytical, just getting data and then being able to read back that data in a literal way. It takes flexibility. It takes uh, the type of skill that is developed over time. So you're responding in a way that connects to who you are and not just reacting. And so, to me, this is, has a lot to do with communication. It has to do with career and even the interview process. So how do I respond to a question where I actually hadn't prepared for this question? It's totally, do you let it throw you off course or do you just take it in and respond in a way that you had prepared, maybe perhaps not for that exact question, but prepared for when you are you feel like perhaps you're unprepared. Right? Exactly. So you don't have the experience yet. This is something new. Now you take it on as a challenge and you're excited rather than shrinking in fear and being scared. Right. Having the difference between um, just having being so pre planned and so uh, rehearsed. Yes. Right. That you know exactly how it's going to go and you're totally in control mm -hmm. and nothing's going to vary because you've got it going on. and that if something, because what we know from live performance is that yes. something always happens. There's gonna be an unplanned instance. And so moving back into what you know, but being able to adjust to what has changed is where, where presence is, becomes required, right? So now, like you said, it's not a point of angst and anxiety and how am I gonna do this? And, <laughs> and I Oh, I was just going to say, I think this is what you just said was really spot on because it, it makes me think because Manifa and I've had this conversation a lot about being performers. And for example, when we're teaching, you know, especially now that teaching involves technology, but I think of my background teaching in college and university, something goes wrong or you're on the stage and you're, you're a seasoned performer, something goes wrong with technology, or maybe the accompanist doesn't show up, which actually happened to me once. I was standing on stage with, I think, hundred, yeah, I think it's at least 400 people for this spring, spring festival. And, and I turned it to the accompanist and I said, okay, let's, and I, he wasn't there. Oh no. <laughs> so I was standing there and then I think the people who were organizing it were quite new. And so I went off stage and I said, what do I do? They said, go back out. Well, I stalled for a while. I think I stalled for almost 10 minutes. I was telling jokes. I was, you know, just trying to buy time and hoping he would come back. Right. And then I went back off the stage and they said, go tell more jokes, you know? So, oh, wow. uh, but it was interesting. And then he finally showed up as I was talking, but I think I had been up there maybe for 15 minutes. I don't know what I was doing exactly. <laughs> Whatever I was doing was holding their attention. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you have to be in a place where you have to be present, and then this is combined with the now, because now has to do with a demand right now. It's not just a skill that's based over time. 
and then you're responding, you're self-aware, and then you're uh, responding to your environment. But now it's, you're not only expected to do that over this duration, it, there's a high performance task and you must do it in order to make it happen. And it can cause a lot of pressure, at least in my clients, I'd like to hear from yours. So as performance, as performers, I think there's another layer to it. And I don't know what you think. We haven't talked about this, but I think mm -hmm. people from different communities, marginalized communities, either people of color or, you know, people from queer com communities who uh, perhaps are in different spaces where they're expected to do more or they're faced with a reaction they're not expecting. And then they have to have a, a way to speak back so they feel safe in these spaces. I think in a sense, we're more prepared with that presence and now than perhaps other people who aren't faced with the same challenges. Um, yeah, I think some when situations are constantly requesting you to be something you're actually quite not, yes. um, like finding the meeting place between that and then like what you're there to do and all that kind of thing, that becomes part of the practice, right? Um, my clients are a lot of them are in different parts of the world uh some of them originally from the u.s some of them born in other countries and it's interesting because we tend to have that uh experience where you're in a place where you're not really part of the culture or mm -hmm. you're so different from the rest of your family or the rest of the culture that the way they do things that it feels like you're never quite fully yourself. Yes. Right. Um, and there is a little bit of performance there and like role playing and okay, now I have to put on this hat. Yeah. You know, now I have, I had Patrice M. Palmer, who's non-binary trans black, and they were talking about how, you know, they had to like code switch and decide like, do I bring up the trans thing right now or do I just deal with the race thing because I had to choose you know and I don't know it's interesting I don't know what you think about that well I think you know a lot of times again instead of teaching people how to to respond to who you actually are we're responding to what people expect from us and that and yes we get good at performing unfortunately we get good at performing inauthentically yes right because um, of whatever we think is needed to keep our job um, maintain the friendship you know uh, keep the peace essentially right um, and so for my clients it's more of a matter of reclaiming a lot of that identity uh, over all spaces so that they're not um, feeling like their energy and well-being is divided. And, and one of the things that I think that's so important about the work that I do with voice is that it brings them back into an experience of presence. Yes. Right? Um, and so having that experience, they realize, oh, this is what it feels like to not have to rethink who I am, mm -hmm. right? To just come from who I am right now and respond as, a, you know, as how I feel ab about what's happening to me instead of like discerning your filter of what you're seeing from me and then clarifying your filter and then talking to the filter that you see from me from like, you know, mm -hmm. like, and unfortunately there's some people that are so far down the line, sometimes they're still talking to those filters, but the goal is that especially in your own space like if somebody is coming to your space mm -hmm. your space is defined by the fact that you are you that you're not defending that you're not ex having to like over explain that and one of the really amazing things is that once you've learn to just go with that flow of like what's actually how you actually are feeling what you actually want to say you can have the sense of um, going into a zone, right? Mm. So you're not constantly fighting this, well, am I, am I in the right lane? Am I on the right river? Am I, you know, am I doing it right? That constant question of, am I doing it right? Comes, I think, from these ideas that we have to play to these filters in, as different people. Mm. I like that. And I think, I think that's a real, 
kind of like a way that both of our practices, you know, like that intersection, because the way I've always experienced how you have taught voice is integration, right? And wholeness. And I think a lot of the way I teach communication and speech is very similar. I may have like a slightly different path to get there because I acknowledge those fragmentations. And I think a lot of my clients come to me feeling like that. And so I help them work through that. And perhaps you do too, but it's part of my philosophy. But then that, I think our ultimate goal is very much the same. It's like, how do we integrate who you are in your core, like who you always knew yourself to be and who you are and how do we help you know that that is, you can be that person despite what you're hearing and the reflections you're getting from other people, how can you then perhaps take that as information for next time, but not be, not just become that reflection or feel like you have to speak to it. But now you can take it as, like I said, data. Okay. I hear you. I hear what you're saying, but we're going to do this. <laughs> Actually, I can do this other thing. You know, I'd heard a, a story about when the process of the voting was happening with Trump supporters and he had, the Trump administration wanted to have people in the voting, in the places where they were counting the ballots to make sure they were doing it right. And, but there was a lot of really strange things that happened with the interactions with the people who were counting the ballots who were balanced. There were Republicans and there were Democrats and people from all sides and the people who were coming in who I don't, not even sure who they were. And I know one story I heard was that people of color who were counting those ballots weren't, the reflections were very different from who they were. So like there was an African-American woman who was counting the ballots and then uh, someone who was elected to go in there started questioning her, her legitimacy of her process and did she know how to count? I mean, it was very insulting. And then, and the legality. And then she said, well, actually I'm a lawyer. So we can talk about that, <laughs> which sort of, you know, she did, she wasn't deterred from the, how I heard the third hand conversation. She wasn't deterred. She didn't start crying or whatever, which is okay if that happens, but she took the information in and she said, okay, I hear what you're saying. I know where you're going with this. This is who I am. Now, what are we going to do? And then right. the person just, you know, oh, I guess I'm going to walk away. That's what we're going to do, <laughs> you know? And how do we, when we think about these terms, I think something I brought up that was one of my contributions. So when Manifa was brought this topic to the podcast was, I think these terms are very intimidating for people if they don't understand that there are steps to get there. I think, especially in American culture, we want everything right now. And we think we can get that. And for some things we can, like things to buy if we have the money. <laughs> but I think for skills and for awareness, that takes time. And so I think it's really great what Manifa said about the, there, these are steps to get to this now. It's not something that you should be expected to do like that. Like you come out, you know, you're born, you go through all these things and you're dealing with it. Those you know, those poor incorrect reflections and now you are trying to be your authentic self and now you're just there. It's like, no, this is a process. For it sure. takes time and it's, there's a, there's kind of, to me, I really like that self-care part of this conversation. Like what are the ways we can support our clients so that they can work through what they have to work through to get to the place, to even get to the place where they say, I, I want to become present. They're not, they're saying, the way I've been reacting, I've been in the cycle of reacting, which keeps me in the place that I know I don't belong. And perhaps I have all of these skills and yet I feel like I'm at the bottom. So I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. I'd be interested to hear your experience. Yes, um, what I've seen and, and what I work on almost you know, every point of a, of a client session is essentially getting them to a place where they feel safe enough that they can move into the moment so that they get the experience. Like my goal is just to have them have the experience so much that they not, they're no longer satisfied with the other, the other thing. Um, 
And so, and a lot of that becomes like kind of a, a trust relationship in the beginning where I'm just kind of developing the, what I call a container where they can feel mm -hmm. that they're safe and supported. And then it's kind of just like them seeing what they become when they relax into that. And when, you know, we do that through breath exercises and voice exercises. And uh, this would be, I think one of the things I wanted to speak to is a little bit on how I think of some of the things in my, my voice, I guess, theory I'm developing uh, is, is that in this um, presence and now in this like idea that we're talking about, that I have a version of how I apply kind of masculine energy and feminine mm -hmm. energy concepts to this. And my version is that uh, the now is a more of a masculine energy. Mm -hmm. And then the feminine energy is more presence. Because mm -hmm. if you think again, like at the time framework and like Shannon was saying, you're thinking more of a cycle. Mm -hmm. I think of it more as a flow. And mm -hmm. so it's actually something that moves through us. Yes. Right. Um, and then the now framework being just like now, or like, you know, what some of the terminology that came to me was get in the zone mm -hmm. or, um, or just do it even. Yes. That, or su suck. I mean, this is, has, has its own iterations, but like suck it up and just, yeah, just do it. Just right? do it. Like right? there's all, you have 10 <laughs> things to do. You just got to knock them out and do it. Right. And like they don't, and, and there are, well, there are books on this, but uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, nobody says, well, how do you get to want to do it? Or yes. how do I get into the zone? Because, you know, the zone, you're either in the zone or you're not in the zone. Mm -hmm. So how do I get there? Um, <laughs> like nowness being so absolute uh, that if you feel like if you miss one now that you'll never get to another one, this kind of, like you said, pressure mm -hmm. to to perform, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and, and so, yeah, and when in the voice itself, it's, it's never one or the other, and the one can lead you to the other, right? Mm -hmm. So again, we're talking about how awareness is necessary for presence, and uh, to me, presence as the flow and voice is symbolized by the breath, the movement, because that's continually moving, it's a cycle, it's an in and out, it's, uh, you know, one of those things that continues to move and that requires a framework of time. And then the nowness and voice for me is vowels because mm. that's how the sound occurs. Yes. Right. And so what I think the misconception is, is that it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. Either you're present and you're flowing <laughs> and you're, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna go with it. Or, you know, you're either you're, you're just in that, in that um, energy of just allowing, or you're, you're, you got it, you mm -hmm. got it, you're, you're there, you don't need any help, you don't need any, like you, you, you're either wrong, or you're not, or you're right, or you're not, you know, and I think it also goes, I've been hearing this conversation circulating, just made me think of it that bootstrap mentality mm -hmm. that comes from a very much like a I don't know to call it like a American industrialist or colonialist perspective that you know people didn't have help to get to where they are they just rose through their greatness right we're using that word that now has become a word we can't really use in as much anymore with uh, making America great again. Right? Oh, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. we think about we think about this idea of that pressure to perform. And this is something that my clients experience a lot. The idea that you're you become who you are by yourself is a very um, comes from that background of not thinking about cultures that are derived on collectives mm. and familiar familial identities or uh, love that derives not just between two people that then are on their own, but is from a family. Mm. And, and there is this sense that not only should you be in the now, but in that bootstrap perspective, which is very colonialist and white supremacist, that we are now, we are supposed to get there on our own through 
our superior genes or whatever you want to say, like we should be born ready. That's a, I don't know where that comes from, but I remember hearing that when I was growing up, born ready, whatever that means mm. is very <laughs> eugenics. Like, and something I used to always do with my students, many of whom were coming from uh, like more disenfranchised backgrounds. Like when I work with the Asian Pacific Islander students who were South Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian Pacific Islander, so newer immigrants uh, and let them go up there with people to do their speeches that let's break that barrier of you have to do this alone. And I'm going to actually push you past your limits, like a mili more of a mil militaristic perspective. I'm going to test your, your limits in this forceful way, in this violent way so that you get to where you're going. So then let's say you do get there and then now you've created this pattern, this zero sum pattern where you feel like you started at nothing and you pushed yourself in an unhealthy way, in a stressful way, in an anxiety ridden way to get to this goal. And now you think every time to get to this goal, I have to push myself in the same way. I can't, I shouldn't get enough sleep or maybe I'm eating a, like this high sugar, high caffeine diet. And then I'm speaking a hundred miles a minute and I think I'm succeeding, right? So this is not a sustainable way to do things is part of my point. And the idea, I think the unhealthy notion of what now means, and I think that's something we want to talk about too, to kind of debunk that just a little bit, especially for people that are tuning in that are turned off by those terms to think about why are you turned off? You're turned off because it's not, it's not possible. And I don't think, or it's a fluke perhaps, Let's say you do succeed at a high performance task that you didn't prepare for, but you just pressure, put a lot of pressure on yourself. And then you did all this stuff at the last minute and then it came out great. That might happen once, but can you count on it? No. <laughs> Should you be drinking, you know, five espressos so you have confidence? Right. In the eighties doing a line of Coke, right? I know maybe people still do that. There's a new one. You know, this, I think, the beauty of the way that we're talking about this right now, it's not only referring to the issues of people of color and other marginalized folks, but it's also talking about all of us and the system that's been, that's been set up, how these terms have been misused to, ha to have only a certain percentage of people succeed while everyone else can't. Because the truth is, is the people that come across and say, I just spoke and it came out great. Or I just, I somehow went up on stage and started singing opera. You know, it's, yeah, that's not going to happen. Like those people actually, they probably have like tens of thousands or more dollars and like at least a decade of training, whether it's elite prep schools or, you know, the best of tutors and coaches. And so it is, maybe we can talk a little bit about this, the negative side of this and how the, the, the part that's a myth because I think these terms don't have to be a myth. They can be highly positive and productive. It's just how we frame them and how we talk about the preparation to get there. Yeah, uh, so for the, I think especially around the masking, because again, I feel like this goes to a history of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and there is a more whole way to, to perceive it and to, to take part in the concept, right? Sure. And I think one of the biggest things that we do, you know, as we are correcting or, uh, or healing things that haven't worked for us in the past is that we just flip to the other side, right? Well, yeah. if that's the wrong way, then the right way must be more feminine, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of, I was, I was making it, being a little facetious when I was talking about the feminine side, just go with the flow, right? <laughs> um, and, and the reality is, is that it's always both. This is something sure. I am constantly saying, like, <laughs> as a teacher, uh, a voice, and as somebody who's always trying to help people see the larger concept at play. Um, it's always both, right? Even the now mm -hmm. requires a sense of presence, mm -hmm. you know, in order for you to be, per you know, perceive that you're in the now, mm -hmm. 
right? Uh, another part of it is that, you know, a lot of people when they're singing, they'll try to say the vowel um, without the breath and they'll try mm. to, to like use so much breath in or, and then they lose track of the vowel, the vowel gets corrupted, right? And, um, and it's never one or the other. And the reality is you need one for the other. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. have one without the other. You're not gonna have a sound without a vowel. It's just not possible, right? So you're not gonna have a sense of presence if you're not aware of the now moment. Mm -hmm. And then vice versa, you're not, the, the vowel's not gonna sound without a flow of breath, without the cycle of presence, without having an association of time. You just, it's, that's one of the reasons why we decided to take this crazy trip to begin with, because we <laughs> needed the, the body and the relationship to have the experience and to experience new things. And I also think, you know, putting form to something that didn't originally have form. So a lot yeah. of, you know, across time, uh, different people have been called feminine as a pejorative, not just women, but you know, yeah. people of color, like I know Asian men, there was that whole thing about them being feminine, even mm -hmm. though they're just, I'm just being me, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. why do I have to be feminine? Or, you know, different people in the queer community, femininity being more valued in that community, but outside of that community, it's not valued, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really interesting because we've taking this topic that you're talking about and putting it through what ephemeral has meant to us and how it's shifted since when we started, where we thought of it more literally as femme and femininity. And now we, and then we opened it up to, you know, BIPOC people and um, gender non-conforming people is those masculine and feminine uh, energies or the practices or the results, whatever you want to call it. It's, and you brought this up, it's that the, th the practices that we engage in our, in our businesses, such as breath meditation, such as affirmation, such as visualization, such as vocalization, such as movement, and sometimes if it calls for that, those all, as you had said, belie that strict distinction between the feminine and masculine and, and shows that these things coexist together or sometimes can even coexist so hard that they burst apart that binary of masculine and feminine and they become something completely else which is the whole gender non-conforming thing mm -hmm. and I think where we're headed as like a people just really challenging these terms so I think well, maybe and then even asking why we 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 like one more than the other sure like why value one over the other who is benefiting from that and how as a people or do we feel like maybe even cheated you know, if, if we feel like how we associate or identify or orient or ourselves as perhaps feminine people or people who don't just take charge and roll over everyone, you know, in an extreme of masculine, because that's, there's toxic masculinity and then there's, I think, more productive, positive ones. So yeah, wanna... and again, I think that's important for the idea of integration, because when you, once you start judging anything you're mm -hmm. judging a part of yourself there there is no there's only one right this is yes. kind of the concept that always comes up in spirituality and so uh so what i am always looking for is well what part of me is that yes you know and am i okay with that have i accepted mm -hmm. all of myself so i that's one of the things that i'm always asking is like well what part of me is that yes and and am I okay with all of myself, mm -hmm. you know? And if I'm not, then, you know, that's something I don't need, I need to work on. I want to be sure. okay with who I am, even the parts that I may not come to the forefront a lot. Or even right? the parts that aren't deemed positive immediately. They're the, exactly. they're, they're, it's the icky, or say the icky, but it's the thing where you're not present. You're not in the now. Sometimes you have to go through that in order to get to that more aware, we'd say refined awareness. I don't know what you want to say. The better version of yourself that you know yourself to be. Sometimes you have to go through that hall of mirrors where you see all those negative reflections and deal with it and feel that pain. Because maybe you were 
numbing yourself. And so you didn't want to deal with those reflections, but they're there, they're following you around. Maybe you're like carrying around the hall of mirrors you know, in a trolley or I don't know. But well, I was yeah, thinking- I think it's always, they're always present one way or another in the pain it's in the denial of those things and that's why it becomes so important you know to have the experience because we only have the experience to to heal it you know so maybe on that note we can spend just we have about five minutes so we can spend maybe i can just do like a minute to a meditation you want to follow up with voice and then we'll close the podcast does that sound okay with you sounds fabulous okay so i'm just going to start i'm not going to go into a lot of setup but wherever you're seated right now just go ahead and get comfortable in that place if you're comfortable go ahead and close your eyes and just notice your breath so breathing through your nose what is your breath doing right now how is it settling in your body And how do you imagine yourself when you're walking throughout your day or you're zooming throughout your day as we have now? What do you see when you look in the mirror or the screen? Who is that person there? And just continue to breathe, feeling your breath, filling up your body with fresh air and breathing out some of those images that perhaps you wanna let go of, letting go of that baggage that you're carrying around. I want you to, without a lot of instruction, just go into a deeper breath that derives from the belly and let in a little more air at a slower pace. So I'm gonna count, I'm gonna breathe in, one, two, Three, and you're going to breathe out longer to let go of that baggage. One, two, three, four, five. And we'll just do one more. One, two, three. And breathe out. One, two, three, four, five. And then do one on your own. Filling yourself up with the person you know yourself to be and letting go of those reflections, that baggage with the longer exhalation and go ahead when you get to the end and return back to your natural breath. How does that feel different now? Now that you've sort of parsed those things out, the person whom you know yourself not to be, but perhaps you've been invaded with those images and ideas for a long time, and the person you know yourself to be. Feel how that feels lighter in your body now. Maybe your breath feels more balanced. Your body feels more relaxed. Go ahead, wiggle your fingers and toes and open your eyes. (laughs) It's always good to to be focused on breath. Mm -hmm. So, um, For mine, I'm just going to give you an example. So again, we have the experience. So first, we're going to try to make some sounds without vowels. And so a lot of our consonants, we don't hear unless we have a vowel attachment. So we're literally going through the the alphabet. A, you can hear that because that's a vowel. A vowel is not a B right? It's just a, which is a lot of times why people will go through b, p, t, right? And why um, in military, they'll actually say alpha, bravo, right? Mm. So that you know what the actual letter is, and that are not confusing different language uh, vowel associations with the consonants. Now, now I want you to use your breath. So we're gonna use our breath to do a sigh. So we're just gonna breathe all the way up, just sigh it out, right? And I always get a little noisy with it, so you know what I'm doing. But in general, you don't hear the breath, right? By itself. 
And then when you put them together, we're gonna sigh on the vowel ah. So you're gonna have to repeat the vowel in order for the sound to continue clearly, right? So that is your sigh on ah, one, two, three. Oh, yeah. So you keep repeating that. And if the, I'm gonna give another weird example. If I say vowel one, uh, one time without repeating it, what's gonna happen with the breath continuing? Oh. Right, you heard the beginning, uh, but the other parts won't show up as clearly. Or you can do it the Southern fashion because I'm from the South, so I get to be <laughs> funny, y'all. Um, oh, it turns into a thousand other vowels and eventually it kind of corrupts the sound as it goes out, right? And, and so that's the example of why we need both, why your masculine energy isn't necessarily wrong and your feminine mm -hmm. energy isn't necessarily wrong, but how can we get them to work together and so that we're not in an imbalance. And sometimes mm -hmm. more is required than the other. That's another thing voice teaches us. So I love that. And I love the way that we can think about that as sort of like a process in the body, right? It's not something that you made happen through just thinking through it, but it's something that you involved experience, perspective, a way to grow. And I, I really love that. So I think I actually need to close the podcast. I'd love to continue for another hour. Or so oh, thank you so much for joining us on our thank podcast. you. So we'll and just oh go ahead. We'll see you on the next one. So this is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, communication coach consultant. And I'm Anifa Harris, a voice empowerment coach. And you were here with Ephemeral, episode six, your presence is required to be in the now. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.